Welcome to Activities to Do with a Person Living with Dementia. Today we're going to look at what makes something an activity. We'll look at things to consider to increase the opportunities for success. Things to think about when choosing an activity. Where and when to do an activity. Different ways to think about presenting an activity. And then we'll finish up by looking at different types of activities with examples. Before we get started, I think it's important to understand a little bit about who we are. The Alzheimer's Society of BC's vision is a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. We believe that world begins with a more dementia-friendly society where people affected by dementia are acknowledged, supported, and included. Our mission is how we are working towards that vision. We ensure that people affected by dementia are not alone by educating and mobilizing a broader community of care around them. That includes you on this webinar and supporting valuable research into the disease and people living with it. So what is it that makes something an activity? Activities include almost everything we do in our life, our job, roles, leisure time, self-care, all the things that we do in a day. For the person living with dementia, activities are much more than just a way to occupy their time. Just like for those of us without dementia, activities provide an opportunity for meaningful experience and purpose. Keep in mind, there is no such thing as a dementia activity. No one activity is ideal for all people with dementia because everyone is unique with different personality, interests, past experiences, and abilities. People living with dementia may find everyday activities increasingly difficult and feel badly for not being able to do what once was effortless. People have shared with us that it can be very frustrating to no longer be able to follow a spirited discussion, for example, or to count out the correct change at the store, or to follow a familiar recipe for dinner. That's why failure-free activities for people living with dementia are so important. Activities that always come out right, no matter what. Being happily engaged in a satisfying activity reduces agitation, anxiety, depression, and anger, just as it does for people who are not living with dementia. As a caregiver, your role is to try to create the best chance of an activity being successful. So how do you do that? How do you create those opportunities for successful activities? Focus on remaining skills and match the activity to the person's abilities. Keep in mind changing physical abilities that might impact participation. This might mean adapting as things change. For example, playing cards change from a complex game to a simpler game. For example, a caregiver shared with us that they changed from a card game where each hand had an increasing number of cards and the wild card changed each hand to one which was simply seven cards in each hand and they just used a, a, a throwaway. Then that worked really well for a while, but the person living with dementia had a long experience with games that involved Trump. And she kept asking, what is Trump? The caregiver adapted again and said, we'll just cut each hand for Trump. So it turn over a random card and that suit would be Trump for the hand. It seems to be working at present, she, she explains to us, and she is aware that things might need to change again. Make sure the activity matches their interests and seems meaningful, rewarding. 
keep in mind that because of dementia, the person's preferences and personality may change. They may be open to trying things that they wouldn't have considered previously. Choose activities that don't appear to be childish for the person living with dementia. It doesn't matter if they appear childish to you. So be open to those opportunities for things that they may not have previously considered. If possible, though, suggest an activity that both you and the person living with dementia will enjoy. It's easier to be involved if you also enjoy the activity. Keep choices limited to prevent overwhelming the person, particularly in the later stages of dementia, and involve as many of the five senses as you can. Always spend a little time afterwards assessing whether the activity was enjoyable, whether it was too difficult, or whether it was too easy. And if your person living with dementia is in the early stages of the disease, involve them in this assessment if they can participate. For example, if going out to restaurants has been a common experience for you, you might need to consider that the person's needs have changed. Consider whether the restaurant is loud and has lots of children. Maybe that is too much stimulation and distraction. Maybe you need to select a different restaurant, or perhaps you can request to be seated in a quieter section. Maybe suggest to the waitress that you don't need menus and just order familiar dishes. Don't be surprised if the person's tastes have changed. One caregiver shared that he and his wife regularly go out for dinner. She loves and he hates shepherd's pie. When their meals came, she insisted that she was the one that hated shepherd's pie, and she was sure that the waitress had switched the meals. He told us it was easier to just eat the shepherd's pie that time, and now he makes sure that they order the same dish, not shepherd's pie when he can avoid it. Most dementias are progressive, and we broadly group the progression into three stages. These stages are not clearly defined, and they will be different for each person, but it can be helpful to think of activities as being appropriate for each of these three stages. The goals for activities at the early stage are to provide a sense of purpose and enjoyment, boost self-esteem, decrease anxiety, nurture togetherness, and maintain socialization. Again, familiar refrain, focus on re retaining remaining skills. Encourage continuity with current lifestyle. This picture is Mario Gregario, who has dementia. Mario has developed a passion for photography in his later life. And if you attend other of our workshops, some of the images in many of our presentations are Mario's. It's something that dementia uh, and no longer being able to work has allowed him to really indulge and to increase his abilities but he's very aware that he has to adapt where necessary to accommodate lost short-term memory and other lost skills. Mario has connected with a physically active group of photographers because he himself is very physically active and likes to go for very long walks. So if he is going somewhere new to take pictures, he ensures he doesn't go alone. Minimal supervision is required at the early stages, but certainly when heading out into unfamiliar territory, it's always a good idea. Activities at the middle stage, the goals are to maintain self-esteem, often through reminiscing, to maintain communication and social skills, to provide a sense of accomplishment and fun, prevent boredom, 
maintain good physical health. Middle stage activities require simpler, shorter activities and simpler, shorter instructions. More focus on past life activities. For example, if someone was a previous carpenter, helping them get involved with a sanding project, having them, maybe you can um, make picture frames together or buy unfinished picture frames and they can sand them. More supervision is advised because more severe memory loss and more limited physical skills can require more supervision and, inst and simple instructions. At the late stage, the goals change a bit more. So goals for activities at this stage are to provide relief from stress and frustration, to provide reassurance, to promote dignity and comfort, to connect through emotions and the five senses. Because of increasing losses, it's important that at this stage activities be even shorter, less frequent, and less demanding. Steps are likely to need to be greatly simplified to meet mental, physical, and social abilities. Focus on enhancing the quality of life and repetitive activities are particularly calming and soothing. It's why I particularly love this picture. Um, we all have a need, you can remember from earlier in the presentation, we all have a need to be involved with activities that are meaningful and rewarding. Doing something repetitive like folding the towels can be very, very helpful at this stage. It's calming. It's easy to do, physically easy. Most of us have a lifetime of memories of folding basic laundry like towels. And smaller towels like this are easy to handle. And at the end of the activity or at any point during the activity, you can see a physical um, reminder of the work that you have accomplished, a growing pile of folded activities. Supervision is recommended and often required at this later stage. It's important to note each person is different, so it might take some trial and error to find activities that appeal. As always, avoid sharp objects and only give items that are going to be safe for the person living with dementia. For example, if they tend to put things in their mouth, avoid um, really small pieces or pieces of string, for example. When and where. It's important to consider the time and location when planning an activity. Choose a time of day that is most appropriate. For example, for an activity that requires concentration and energy, choose a time when the person's level of functioning is at its highest. For many people in, with dementia, this is in the morning. But for an activity where the goal is to relieve tension, choose a time of day when the person usually feels anxious or just before that feeling usually occurs. Make sure that the environment is safe for the person living with dementia. In thinking about whether the environment is appropriate, consider noise and distraction levels. Think about how long an activity will be. For example, if you are considering going on a group outing, how long will the outing be? How much walking will be involved? And will there be places and time to sit and rest? Will there be easy access to readily available washrooms? What if your person decides not to participate in a group outing halfway through? Have you got a contingency plan? Make sure that the lighting is appropriate, that it's bright enough 
but that there is no glare. So, for example, if you're outside, that the person living with dementia is not sitting with the sun shining directly into their eyes. They may not be able to express what's wrong, but they certainly will experience the glare of bright light as uncomfortable. Doing in activities in familiar environments can help to reduce stress and allows for better participation. So having a particular area in your home or in their home that is often where activities take place and wherever possible, integrate activities into a daily routine. Structure helps to orient the person living Give a reason for the activity. For example, introduce the activity by asking the person living with dementia if they can help you with a project or a chore. Framing the activity as a way to help and offering an end goal can enhance the person's sense of purpose and desire to, com to complete the activity. You can also ask them if they would join you in an activity because you would enjoy their company. Simply asking, do you want to do X, may not be effective because for many people with dementia, the part of the brain that switches us on, that activates us to get up and get involved, that part of the brain may be damaged. And at the same time, the parts of the brain that um, provide insight and allow us to understand ourselves and, for example, for someone to know that they are living with dementia, for many people, that part of the brain can be damaged. And so the person may not be aware that they have dementia and they may not be able to be motivated to motivate themselves to get involved. So finding other ways to present the activity, asking them to help you, asking them to be involved because you want their, um, their company. So can you help me? Or I'd like to do this together. Break down the instructions into a few simple steps. Demonstrate when you instruct and only offer help when it's clearly needed. Be supportive and encouraging. Don't criticize. It's important to remember the goal is not the end product, but the goal is the enjoyment of the activity. Keep adapting familiar activities to the person's changing skill level. Do the activity with the person or at least start the activity with the person as a way to show the different steps involved. You probably are familiar with the fact that it's often easier to mimic someone rather than listen to a set of instructions. Ask the person to only do some parts of a project or leave partially completed activities around the house. For example, leave the dinner table with only some of the plates and silverware set in the right place. Seeing it started makes it easier to continue and follow the pattern. Thank the person or express your appreciation when the activity is completed. It's often those closest to us that we neglect to thank and to appreciate. And it can go a long way to, um, to adding to a sense of accomplishment, um, knowing that you did something that was helpful. You know what that feels like. So thank your person living with dementia. Remember, involving people in activities is not simply a way to keep them busy. Activities provide valuable opportunities to share a meaningful moment and boost self-esteem. Just want to take a little moment to think about how we communicate. We know that communication involves much more than words. So for example, pitch and tone of voice, they express emotion and authenticity. 
If I were presenting this and I were slumped in my slumped in my chair and really just kind of monotone, that would come across and would communicate to you that I wasn't particularly interested and engaged with the subject that I was presenting. That's true even if you can see me. Other types of um, things communicate. So nonverbal body language, posture. I mentioned if I was slumped in my chair, that would come across in my tone of voice. Body positioning, gestures, touch, facial expressions, and our eyes. Are you making eye contact? All of those pieces of our communication are very important to the way in which we present and communicate information. Our nonverbal communication speaks as loudly and often more loudly than our words. So we looked at activities for the three stages of dementia. It's a way to think about grouping them. Another way to think of grouping activities, these are just handy labels. There's nothing magical about them. But another way to think about them is in this list, reminiscing, anxiety reducing, sensory, calming, and activities of daily living. So reminiscing activities, they offer an opportunity to recall the past and re-experience the emotions attached to these memories. Use familiar objects to prompt a memory. These are all different examples of memory boxes that you can create tailored to the past interests of the person living with dementia. You can also try other aids that incorporate a sensory experience, pictures, videos, smells, sounds, textures, things that people are familiar with. So for example, for a former office worker, create a box that reminds them of their career. Include paper clips, pencils, erasers, paper, letters, even junk mail, a calculator, file folders, notepads, all of those kinds of things. If someone really strongly identified with an office role, those can be very helpful. If the person used to be a handy person, put nuts and bolts, PVC pipe pieces and fittings, a piece of wood, watch out for splinters, fine grit sandpaper and a ball of twine. Someone who enjoyed cooking or baking might enjoy measuring spoons, a whisk, spatula, those kinds of related items. This can work for any job or hobby. Just be creative about finding objects that will be safe to handle. And reminiscing is often a wonderful way to spend time with someone. You go through the box and you may hear stories you'd never so with reminiscing, you focus on long-term memory. It can help re-experience past experiences and emotions. We've all had the experience of catching an unexpected piece of music or a scent, and it can completely transport us back to a particular time and we feel those emotions again. That's the purpose behind reminiscing activities. You want to consider past successes, whether it's fishing, crafting, sewing, electrical or carpentry work, vacation or family photos. In the previous slide there was all these picture all those pictures of different kinds of experience boxes. It is a tremendous way to stimulate conversation and to raise self-esteem. Just always remember to keep the things in the box safe. Anxiety reducing activities. The purpose is to reduce anxiety and to help prevent outbursts, restlessness, and responsive behaviors. So 
these activities help distract the person. Repetitive activities are often good, such as brisk walks, cleaning the counter, and sorting objects. These can be particularly effective at reducing anxiety, especially in the later stages of dementia. Sensory activities. Sensory therapy is, an also, is also an effective method for reducing anxiety, calming nerves, and providing comfort. Use as many of the five senses as you can to elicit pleasant feelings, memories, or a connection with the person's surroundings. Example, aromatherapy, massage, dabbling your hands in water, putting your hands in the stream of a hose or in a, into a creek or the ocean, or being barefoot in the sand. You could create with aromatherapy, for example, scented cards with a theme like winter, or baking. Put a, create a number of little strips of card and put a dab of vanilla, um, a dab of nutmeg oil, um, rub a bit of cinnamon uh, into it, um, find some pine oil, those kinds of things. Things that are scents that are going to mean something to the person always keeping in mind that there are people who are very, very sensitive to strong smells. So you know whether this is appropriate for your person or not. Consider things like sensory bags. Um, I found a really, really neat DIY project uh, just by Googling sensory bags. And it was a DIY aquarium bag where there were things like water beads and ocean animals in a sealed bag that could be felt and manipulated. I actually thought it looked like a lot of fun to try and make one. Sorting objects. Consider keeping a bag of coins handy to sort into small glass or ceramic bowls or mixed nuts and bolts or buttons. Asking someone to help you sort a pile of X can give them that sense of purpose. And if you can imagine how satisfying and interesting it sounds, dropping those into different glass bowls, the sound is part of the activity. Popping bubble wrap. If you have never experienced popping bubble wrap, I strongly encourage you to go down to your latest post, to your closest post office or shipping store and buy a square of bubble wrap and just sit and pop it. It is surprisingly enjoyable and satisfying. You can uh, watch old movies together or scenery videos or Many of our, um, like TELUS and Shaw, both have um, something called the frame channel, where it's just pictures that change every 20 or 30 seconds or so. One caregiver shared with us that she looks up and Googles on YouTube um, travel videos, and she has found a couple of uh, presenters that she particularly likes and that often are covering areas that she and her husband traveled to and they both really enjoy watching those videos together. Baking or cooking just to enjoy the smells. Think of things like cookies or bread or soup, something that has wonderful, wonderful scents connected to it. Non-toxic finger paints. Remember, of course, to cover the surface with plastic or brown paper. This is one of those um, examples of an activity that can seem somewhat childish to you, but if, especially if you try it with them, you may be very surprised. There's something wonderfully sensuous about paint on the fingers and spreading it around and making different patterns and things in the paint. Having their hair brushed. As we get older, we often lose um, the opportunity to physically connect with each other. And so just something as simple as having their hair brushed 
or allowing them to brush your hair can be a really important uh, connection moment. Calming activities. Calm the feeling of being overwhelmed by the environment. So this could be things like listening to quiet music, pet therapy, like cuddling with the horse here. Think of yoga, tai chi, breathing exercises, visualization. There's some wonderful um, visualization exercises available for free on the internet. Spending time gardening can be, for many, a really meditative experience. And many care homes now have sensory rooms, which are often a room that is um, somewhat removed from the regular day-to-day -day hustle and bustle, tends to be quiet, often with quiet music playing, low lights, sometimes um, aromatherapy or scents, and maybe even something tactile to play with, a furry blanket or something like that, just to play with it in your hands. That can be a, a lovely way for a person living with dementia to calm. Actually, to be honest, I think it sounds quite wonderful for all of us. So there is, as I mentioned, overlap in many of these areas. Um, but the idea of calming activities versus anxiety reducing activities is calming activities um, really are focused on reducing the sense of being overwhelmed and anxiety reducing activities are designed to prevent outburst, restlessness and responsive behaviors. So obviously calming activities will do that too. So you're going to find the right balance for your Activities of daily living are ones that you may hear this phrase from your case manager if you're at that point. It's nothing special. It just means things that we do in our regular lives, like brushing our teeth, dressing ourselves, vacuuming, washing dishes. For many of us, though, we fall into the trap of wanting to help our person living with dementia, to protect them from the changes that they are experiencing. But in fact, continuing to do as many activities of daily life as possible is helpful to maintain their current skills and to encourage a feeling of independence. The activities will likely need to change as the disease progresses. So for example, gardening. Initially, very little might change, except perhaps needing a little more help or guidance in picking out plants. Then, over time, it may be that as, a, as abilities fall away, the person can still help select between two different choices and then dig the holes to put the pre-selected plants into. So, do you think this plant or this plant would go there? Or, instead of two plants, two spaces. We're going to plant these today. Do you think they should go here or here? Finally, just sitting in the garden enjoying it might be enough, or holding the hose to, to help with watering. Helping with cooking or baking. At the beginning, maybe they are um, a usual baker, and perhaps all you need to do is help select the recipe for that night. I know of couples where uh, she is still working and he takes on most of the cooking. And at the beginning found that, yep, all they had to do was choose a recipe together. Then over time, she found she had to uh, help select the recipe and set out the ingredients, not necessarily measure them out or anything, but help to uh, leave them sitting out on the counter and perhaps with a note plus the chicken that's in the fridge. Then over time he was no longer able to actually make a recipe but he was still able to take something out of the 
fridge at a particular time, following a note to put it in the oven at a particular temperature. Eventually, that also uh, passed away, and but he still was very interested in being in the kitchen, and so really enjoyed helping to be involved with chopping and washing vegetables um, or measuring ingredients for a recipe. Running the vacuum might be something that hasn't been part of their pattern in the past, but could feel really good to do so now. Physical activity that produces a satisfyingly helpful Half-finished activities can be another great way to get people involved. I mentioned the dishes earlier, and that can motivate the person to finish the started activities. Um, so some folded towels sitting on top of the laundry basket. As I mentioned, the half-set table. You can probably think of other things that relate to your life that would work. They don't require a lot of instructions, and they can really promote independence. Consider past roles, which can maintain self-esteem by providing continuity in life through familiar roles. Consider past hobbies or committees. Perhaps your person used to be the club chair. Now, they may no longer be able to hold that role. Involve club members. To continue, to continue to include the person in meaningful ways. It can be very helpful and in a world where we are trying to destigmatize dementia, having an open discussion about the changes that you or your person with dementia are experiencing um, helps to destigmatize it. You can strategize together about ways. This is particularly helpful for a person who's in the early stages and can participate in this discussion themselves. Be aware. Uh, consider a former place of employment and again, include colleagues. Find out if maybe everybody takes a coffee break at the same time and could you stop in uh, or your person with dementia stop in at that time. Maybe, for example, if it's a trucking company or a fire hall, maybe they could come and help wash the trucks or just visiting. No one shares stories like others in the same professions. Firemen, police, nurses, especially emergency room nurses. Um, maybe at a garage, uh, you could consider coming by just at closing and the manager or a former colleague could discuss some particular problems they're having with a particular vehicle. Many roles have an internal language and it can be really helpful and soothing to hear it again. Even when in a long-term care home, consider activities. One uh, care aide shared with us that uh, there was a former businessman and he lived at her care home and he would come into the main nursing, st nursing station and help file. They had materials set aside for him with various colored file folders and papers and he would work away and be very, very content. He would of often call business meetings for the folks at his table. So we've looked at two different ways of grouping activities. And here is a third way to consider, thinking, them, thinking of them as connecting with body, mind, and spirit. So body, that's physical activities. Any type of physical activity can be good, and there are many, many ways to adapt. For example, cut a pool noodle in half so that you end up with two short pool noodles as opposed to two very long, thin pool noodles, and get a large balloon ball at the dollar store. Not a lot of money involved, and the balloon uh, ball has a little more heft than just a balloon, so it's not quite so likely to float away, but at the same time, it's light and unlikely to cause injury. Anyway, you can sit and whack it back and forth. 
it's uh, having been involved with these um, this particular activity I am surprised by how much fun it is and how satisfying it is to whack that ball lots and lots of laughter think about exercises so stretching chair exercises it just can feel so good and physical activity is good for us consider connecting with the local Alzheimer's Society to find out if you have a Minds in Motion near you and try it out. It's a wonderful program to combine gentle exercise with some social interaction. The next area is the mind, mental activities. So think about the reading the newspaper, reading it to yourself or reading it out loud. Um, you can, particularly in the early stages, many people with dementia still have the retain the ability to learn. And so basic knitting or how to email or think of Mario and his photography, which is something he really mostly took up after his diagnosis can find all sorts of simple word games on the internet. And again, I say simple, but it depends on the stage and the interests and abilities of the person living with dementia. So work together if you can to find some word games that are appropriate. Game shows can be fun, simple memory games, Creative activities can provide an outlet for emotions, self-expression and communication, and provide a connection to the outside world. So listening to music, painting, even the finger painting I mentioned, or visiting a gallery. Social activities are often things that are group activities. So things like going out dancing, and whether it's participating or watching, just being in that environment can be good. Going to church or church socials, um, going to social games like bingo, uh, all sorts of celebrations, family birthdays, uh, cultural holidays. Keep in mind always the level of stimulation and noise and consider how much is appropriate for your person living with dementia. The same is true for visiting. So for example, um, I know a number of people who have considered as the person with dementia has moved into later stages, it may be that you can't have everybody visit all at once. So if, for example, the habit is big family dinners, maybe most of the family gathers in one room and a smaller group, uh, including the person living with dementia, are having dinner in another room. And throughout the evening, different members of the family can come and join and flow in and out of the smaller group so that the person living with dementia gets to see everyone, but doesn't have to experience what can be overwhelming when there's a huge room full of people. Consider also um, doing errands, things like going to the hairdresser is a wonderfully social activity. And consider adult day program. It can be wonderful for both of you, a bit of a break for the caregiver, and a really a nice way to connect with other people for the person living with dementia. It can even be a really lovely way to expand your own knowledge and to share it with others. I've recently had a wonderful example where a caregiver w uh, shared with us that she was feeling frustrated because the adult day program that her husband had been going to um, pretty much played bingo for four or five out of the six hours of the adult day program. And her husband was bored and didn't want to go. 
She thought very creatively, I thought, and she did some research into what other types of activities could be good, both for her husband and for others. She's gathering them together into a book, a booklet, and she's going to um, both present the booklet to the facilitators of the Adult Day program, and she's also going to offer to lead a few uh, different activities so that they can see how it plays out and how, um, how differently one might present activities. I really uh, admired her for doing that and thought what a wonderful way to um, make things better for her husband and for the people who are both running and in the adult day program. Other spiritual activities can be the more typically thought of ones, uh, singing hymns, listening to music, walking in nature is a wonderful thing for your spirit. You can almost just feel your soul expand when you're out in an, a lovely environment, like watching sunset or listening to the birds sing in the forest. There are all kinds of spiritual ceremonies. You may have be part of a, a, a spiritual group and asking to have a member of the clergy visit would be something that your person would appear would appreciate. Prayers or meditation can be a wonderful way to spend time. So to summarize, focus on the person's remaining skills and knowledge not on their lost abilities. Keep in mind that because of dementia, the person's preference may change and they may be open to trying things that you would not have considered previously. When possible, especially at the early stages, try to do activities with the person with dementia that are also enjoyable to you. It will make being involved much more enjoyable and much more likely if you enjoy the activity. And ultimately, keep in mind that the process of doing an activity is the goal, not the outcome. The goal is not the end result. The goal is the process, the enjoyment of the activity itself. So I hope you found some things today that sparked some creative uh, thoughts about activities. If you have further questions, don't hesitate to contact us Monday to Friday, 9 to 4, through the First Link Dementia Helpline at 1-800-936-6033. You can also find all sorts of resources and information on our website at www org. We also have resource centers located around the province. You can ask the First Link Dementia Helpline about them or look up information on them on the website. We offer many programs, education, workshops, Minds in Motion, all sorts of things uh, that you may find helpful and local staff who can answer your questions. So again, the First Link Dementia Helpline 1-800-936-6033. Thanks for participating.